Hey everyone, so this week we're going to go over fungi, and fungi is its own kingdom under the domain Eukarya. And a lot of times people get fungi and plants confused. A lot of people think fungi are closely related to plants, mostly because how fungi grow, it's almost plant-like. Um, they really don't move anywhere, they kind of grow outwards like a plant would. Um, but in reality, fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants, meaning that fungi and animals both share a more recent common ancestor than fungi and plants do. And if you really dive into fungi, you could see how they're, they could be more related to animals than plants. All right, so just let's just talk about some of the general characteristics. So they do fall under the domain eukarya, meaning they're eukaryotes. So they do have organelles, a membrane-bound nucleus, everything you'd find in a eukaryote. Now there are different types of fungi. Some are multicellular, while some are unicellular. And remember the difference between the two. On top of some being multicellular and unicellular, some are even multinucleated, and we'll talk about those here in a second. Now here's one of the characteristics that fungi share with animals that they do not share with plants. Fungi are heterotrophs, meaning they do not make their own food. They need to consume their food. And how they do this is release digestive enzymes into the environment to break down organic matter, and then they absorb that organic matter. So while animals will ingest their food by eating it, Fungi release their digestive enzymes into the environment and then reabsorb the nutrients. Okay, so another characteristic that fungi and animal have in common is that they both can make chitin. Now, fungi are going to make chitin in their cell walls. So outside the plasma membrane of each one of their cells, you'll find a cell wall that's made out of this material chitin. Well, in animals, you're going to find it in the exoskeleton of arthropods, which includes insects and crustaceans. So these shells that these animals have are mostly made out of this substance called chitin. So while they both make chitin, both fungi and animalia make chitin, you find it in different locations. In fungi, it's in the cell wall, while in animalia, it's usually in an exoskeleton. Now something very unique with fungi is that they have a haplontic life cycle. So you might have remembered that word from a previous lecture. And really all that means is that the majority of their life cycle is spent in a haploid stage. So most of the adult life cycle is going to be in a 1N ploidy. And the only time they're not going to be 1N is during sexual reproduction. Now fungi can do both asexual and sexual reproduction. And each one has its own benefits and costs. Usually if the environment's great, you can asexually reproduce and everything will be fine. But environments usually aren't consistent and they change constantly. So it's good to have genetic variation through sexual reproduction. And during sexual reproduction, some of these fungi are going to make dikaryotic structures, which is a structure that has an N plus N ploidy, meaning it has two different nuclei in each one of its cells, but the nuclei are not fused together. If the nuclei would be fused together, we would consider that diploid, but in this situation, they're not fused together. They just have two separate nuclei floating around in each cell, making it N plus N. And we already talked about some of the characteristics that fungi have in common with animals, but at the genetic level, they also share a lot of characteristics in common. So molecular evidence suggests that fungi are much more closely related to animals than they are to plants. Okay, so just to touch a little bit more on this, fungi do need to eat their food. They are not autotrophs, they're strictly heterotrophs, meaning they need to digest their food somehow. So they do this by releasing enzymes into the environment to break down organic matter. So because of this, a lot of fungi are really good at decomposing things. So they are very important for a lot of different ecosystems because they act as a major decomposer for that ecosystem, allowing nutrients to be broken down and put back into the environment. But not all fungi are decomposers. Some of them can be parasitic, meaning they can grow on other organisms. And there are a few fungi that are actually carnivorous, meaning they will kill the organism they're trying to eat. And there is a link in this PowerPoint that you can follow to see a small video on these carnivorous fungi. Um, it's not required to watch, but it's very interesting if you want to take a look at it. And it's going to be a video on this fungus right here that specializes in hunting nematodes. So there's a type of fungus that will make a lasso with its hyphae, and I'll talk about what hyphae is in a second. And the nematodes will swim through this lasso where the fungi will clamp down on the nematode then releasing its digestive enzymes to break down that nematode. Okay, so now let's talk about a little bit of the structures of fungi. So fungi are composed of long, slender filaments called hyphae. So that is what fungi are made up of. 
They're very hair-like structures. Now, each one of these strands are considered a hyphae, but when you have a bunch of hyphae coming together of one fungi, this is known as mycelium. So simply, mycelium is just a network of hyphae. And depending on the species of fungi, some hyphae are colanocytic, while others are septated. And what that means is some do not have separation between the cells. So colanocytic fungi do not have any separation from the cells, so these hyphae are actually technically one long cell, while septated hyphae do have a membrane that separates each one of the cells. So the coenocytic fungi are the ones that are going to be multinucleated, while septated are usually uninucleated. And here's an example of each right here. All right, so no membrane separating each one of these cells, so this is technically one long cell of this hyphae. Here is a septated hyphae, meaning each cell is separated and it's uninucleated. All right, a little bit more about the hyphae and mycelium. Now, a lot of times when people think of fungi, the first thing that pops into their mind is a mushroom. Well, a mushroom is actually the reproductive structure of a fungus. So we'll talk about that in a second. And that reproductive structure, that mushroom, is actually a very small part of the fungi itself. The majority of the fungi is actually living underground in a network of mycelium. And remember, mycelium is a network of hyphae. So looking at this picture here, this is the network, or this is the mycelium, which is the network of hyphae. So you have all these hyphae branching out all over the ground. They're releasing digestive enzymes to create or absorb nutrients. But when it comes time to reproduction, that is when they produce the mushroom. And all a mushroom is, is, a, is densely compact hyphae. If you took a mushroom and looked at it under a microscope, a high enough powered microscope, you would be able to see each of the individual hyphae that is making up that fungi. Or that mushroom. Okay, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Fungi mostly live underground as mycelium, which is a network of hyphae. When it comes time to reproduce, that is when they create a mushroom-like structure, this fruiting body structure. And these fruiting bodies are actually made up of densely packed hyphae. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the diversity of fungi. So we're going to spend most of our time on this actually. So there are five major phyla of fungi. And remember, phylum falls right underneath kingdom. And the name of each one of these phyla are based on the sexual structures they produce with their fruiting bodies. Now for fungi phyla, it always ends in the suffix mycota. So it's really the prefix that gives you an idea of what kind of sexual structure they're gonna use for their fruiting body. Okay, so let's dive into this tree a little further too and see who's related to who. So first we have chytridiomycota and zygomycota. We're going to talk about these a little bit. We're not going to spend too much time on them. Um, chytridiomycota specifically is a water mold. So these are fungi that live in the water. And these still have that rear flagella of the lineage of Pistaconta. So that's another structure that can give you a hint that they're related to animals because animals are also a Pistacons having a rear flagella. And then we, the rest of these phylum are land-based fungi, and they do not have their rear flagella anymore. It's believed it was lost through evolution. So first we have zygomycota, which are your bread molds, and these are a lot of these are responsible for contaminating food. Then we have glomeromycota we'll talk about. These usually have a symbiotic relationship with plants, so we'll talk about that as well. Then we have ascomycota, which are the cup fungi, so they have these fruiting bodies that have indentations somewhere on it, so it almost looks like a cup, so we'll talk about those as well. And then we have basidiomycota, which actually makes what we know as a mushroom, so that is their fruiting body. But again, we'll talk more about this in a second. Alright, so as we go through each one of these lineages, we'll talk about these more, but these are a lot of the structures that help give the name to the fungi's phylum. Um, with Chytridiomycota, not so much. They're more defined by their swimming gametes and spores, and that has to do with that rear flagella because they are pistacons. Um, but the Chytridio has to do with their fruiting body structure. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on that, so just keep in mind that Chytridiomycota it has these swimming gametes and spores. Then we'll talk about Zygomycota, and they make a Zygosporangia, and that is where the name is coming from for this phylum. Glomeromycota does sexually reproduce, but we still have not observed it in nature yet. However, we have seen them asexually reproduce. Um, we'll talk more about this in a second, but keep in mind these are the ones that associate themselves with plants and have a symbiotic relationship with the plants. 
Then we have Ascomycota that make Asci, which are sacs, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then we have Basidia, or Basidia Mycota, which makes a Basidia, which means pedestal in Latin, and I will show you the pedestal here in a second. But before we do all that, we need to talk about the, the life cycle of these fungi. Now remember, these are haplontic life cycles, meaning their diploid stage is very short and they spend most of their time in a haploid stage. Now fungi do something very interesting. Now they do not have your typical sexes that we're used to seeing. All right, there's not just a male and female fungi. There's actually thousands of different types of sexes. And who donates the, their genes to who will depend on which two sexes match up with each other. And during sexual reproduction, it's actually broken down into two distinct steps. So it's not just straight fertilization like we see in animals. So in animals, when reproduction occurs, you have a gamete meet another gamete and fertilization happens instantaneously. Usually the sperm will enter the egg and then immediately fuse its DNA with the egg's DNA creating a diploid organism. Well, that same process is spread apart in fungi. What will happen first is that the two cells that are acting as sex cells or gametes are fuse their plasma membranes together, but do not fuse their nuclei. So since these sexual cells are actually haploid, now you have an N plus N cell. So you have these two haploid nuclei inside the same cell, however they're not fused together, so this is N plus N. And this is that dikaryotic cell that we're talking about before. And usually this is what is going to grow the fruiting body. So fruiting bodies are going to be made up of cells that are N plus N. And then somewhere on that fruiting body, then the fungi is going to undergo karyogamy. And karyogamy is the fusion of the karyotes, meaning the nuclei. So somewhere on this heterokaryotic fruiting body, you're going to have a cell fuse its nuclei, becoming diploid, and that diploid will be the zygote of the new fungi. Now the new fungi spends no time in this zygote stage, it immediately undergoes meiosis and turns into spores, where the spores are released into the environment to grow as new hyphae and creating networks of mycelium. Okay, so next we're going to go through the life cycle of a fungi. And um, I encourage everybody to actually draw this out yourself. It makes more sense when you draw these things out yourself and it really helps commit this stuff to memory. Um, really what you need to pay attention here is the structures that are being made and what ploidy these structures are in. All right, so first we're gonna start with the normal adult stage of a fungi, which is the hyphae stage. So remember hyphae are these filaments. Um, they could be coenocytic or they can be septated. I drew septated versions here and these Filaments, or these hyphae, live underground, all right, and they grow in networks of mycelium. Well, every once in a while, the hyphae of one fungus will kind of grow next to the hyphae of another fungus that it would like to reproduce with. So just to label these real quick, so these are hyphae of two different fungi, two different mycelium. Let's try to remember what ploidy these hyphae are. And if you remember that fungi are haplontic, meaning these hyphae are going to be haploid. So one N. Okay, so when one hyphae grows next to another hyphae of another fungus, the first thing that's going to happen is that these two different hyphae are going to grow another cell called a gametangia. And these cells are going to act as gametes. Alright, so hence the name, gametangia, they're going to act as gametes. And they're made through mitosis, so they are still haploid. So you have a haploid cell here, and you have a haploid cell here. Now remember what I mentioned before with fertilization and fungi, it's broken down into two steps. First we have plasma gamete, which is the fusion of the plasma membrane, and later on we have karyogamy, which is the fusion of the nuclei themselves. Well the first thing that's going to happen is plasma gamete. And like we said before, plasma gamete is the fusion, so whenever we see gamete we mean fusion of something, and it's going to be the fusion of the plasma membrane of the two gametangia. So the plasma membrane of each one of these gametangia are going to fuse together to create one cell. However, the nuclei did not fuse, so these nuclei are separated. And if you might remember what this ploidy actually is, it's not diploid because these nuclei are not fused together. Instead, you create a cell that is N plus N, and we call that dikaryotic. So before karyogamy happens, before the fusion of these nuclei happen, this cell is actually going to divide through mitosis to create other cells just like it. So you're going to have the next structure be made up of these dikaryotic cells. So this cell is going to divide through mitosis and grow, and what it grows into is the fruiting body. 
So everything that's been happening so far usually happens underground with most of these different fungi that we're going to talk about. And this N plus N or dikaryotic cell is going to divide through mitosis to create a fruiting body. So here I drew a mushroom, which is a specific type of fruiting body for one of the phylums that we're going to talk about. And the mushrooms that grow out of the ground are actually all dikaryotic. Now remember, these mushrooms are made up of hyphae, so densely packed hyphae. Now I only drew one hyphae here with multiple cells of that hyphae, just to, prove, to, to have a demonstration here. But remember, it's all hyphae made up of these cells that are dikaryotic. So the fruiting body itself, so we'll write that out, fruiting body, which is a mushroom in this example, is all N plus N. It is made up of N plus N cells that have all divided through mitosis from this original cell after plasma gamete. So now we have this fruiting body that's growing out of the ground that is N plus N. Somewhere on the fruiting body, you're going to have a cell undergo karyogamy. With mushrooms specifically, which mushrooms are part of a specific phylum, which we'll talk about, the cell that undergoes karyogamy usually is on the gills. So there'll be a cell somewhere on the gills right here that are going to undergo karyogamy. So I just blew up one of these cells. So this is before karyogamy. We still have an N plus N cell here. And then karyogamy happens. Now let's break down this word. What does gamy mean? It means fusion. And fusion of what? Well, fusion of the karyotes. And by karyotes, we mean nuclei. So this is when the two nuclei are going to fuse together. After karyogamy, we officially have a 2N structure. So this diploid cell is not going to last very long for the fungi. Immediately after this zygote, which it technically is now as a zygote, it, after the zygote is formed, it's immediately going to undergo meiosis. And after meiosis, what you've created is four haploid spores. So now we have spores that are haploid. Now, why are these considered spores and not gametes? Well, because they do not fuse with each other. These spores are going to be flung off into the environment somewhere, all to grow into new hyphae, which will create new networks of mycelium. However, we did successfully have genetic variation through sexual reproduction following this life cycle. So just to recap real quick, the adult stage is hyphae, and it's all haploid. These hyphae grow in networks of mycelium. When a hyphae of one mycelium meets the hyphae of another mycelium of a different fungi, they will then create gametangia. These cells are going to act as gametes, and they will fuse together through plasma gamete, where their plasma membranes fuse together. However, their nuclei are not fused together, so you create an N plus N cell. This N plus N cell is going to divide through mitosis to grow up to be the fruiting body, which is going to be many N plus N cells of densely packed hyphae. And then somewhere on this fruiting body, you're going to have a cell that undergoes karyogamy, which is the fusion of the nuclei. After karyogamy, you have officially made a zygote, which is 2N. And that 2N zygote will not exist very long. It will quickly go through meiosis to create haploid spores, where these haploid spores can then be flung off into the environment to grow up to be new haploid hyphae somewhere else. So that is the complete life cycle of fungi. Now we're going to... Now just try to keep this in mind, um, this is a very generalized life cycle, so we're going to see this more specifically in different phylum of the fungi. Okay, so now we're going to go through the different phylum of these fungi. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is Chytridiomycota. With Chytridiomycota, we're not going to specifically talk about their life cycle. However, there are some special characteristics that you should know of Chytridiomycota. Now, if you remember from the phylogenetic tree that we showed you in the beginning of the different phylum, this is one of the more ancient lineages. And these are also known as water molds because they spend most of their time in water. And because they spend most of their time in water, they actually make flagellated gametes. And that flagellated gamete is going to have a rear flagella. Now, if you remember with fungi, fungi and animals both have the same lineage of Apisticonta. And Apisticonta was defined by having that rear flagella. Well, here's that same rear flagella. So Chytridiomycota is thought to be that missing link between land fungi, which don't have that rear flagella anymore, and the protist that they came from. Now remember, fungi and animals both came from a protist that also had a rear flagella. So this is kind of that in-between or that more ancient lineage of fungi. All right, one more thing you should know about Chytridiomycota is that they create chytrid disease in amphibians. And this is a serious problem for amphibians. Chytrid disease is extremely contagious. So this fungi will grow on the skin of an amphibians and infect the amphibian. 
And we're seeing collapses of a lot of amphibious populations around the world because of this disease. Now, while this disease is a naturally occurring disease, it has a lot to do with human impact because humans have a tendency to connect waterways, which causes the spread of this disease. And once a pond or a lake is infected with Chytridiomycota, there is a good chance that the amphibious population there is going to die. So just keep in mind that Chytridiomycota creates Chytrid's disease in amphibians, which is a very serious problem for a lot of amphibious populations around the world. Okay, so the next phylum we're going to talk about is Glomeromycota. Again, we're not going to talk about the sexual reproduction here or their life cycle, mostly because we have not observed it yet. We know through genetic analysis that they do undergo some sort of sexual reproduction, but it has yet to be observed. So specifically, we're just going to talk about their asexual reproduction and how they are symbiotic with plants. Now, there's two specific groups of glomeromycota. There's arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and then there's ectomycorrhizal fungi. And they're different by key characteristics. All right, so with ectomycorrhizal fungi, this is a network of mycelium, creative of hyphae, that grow in between the cells of plants' roots. So this is a root right here, a plant root. And this fungi is going to grow between the cells of this plant. Now this is a symbiotic relationship. These fungi are going to decompose any of the organic matter in the soil and bring in that nutrients to the plant. And the plant is going to make sugars and pass that off to the fungi here in the root. So key differences between ectomycorrhizal and arbuscular, which we'll talk about in a second, is that ectomycorrhizal will create a sheath of hyphae around the root. So create this blanket around the root and the hyphae don't grow inside the cells of the plant. They grow around the cells of the plant. Now that is different than arbuscular mycorrhizae because they do not create a sheath around the root of the plant. They actually just have their hyphae creating a straight pipeline going into the root, so no sheath. And these hyphae are going to grow into the cells of the plant's root. So that's two key differences between arbuscular mycorrhizae and the ectomycorrhizae. Arbuscular grows inside the cells and does not create a sheath, while the ectomycorrhizae grows outside the cells and does create a sheath. Now we have terms for these two different types of growth. Whenever something is inside a cell, we call that intracellular, I-N-T-R-A, cellular. And intra means within. So intra means inside the cell. Well, here, when things are growing between cells, we call that intercellular. Inter means between, while intra means within. So intercellular growth with the ectomycorrhizae and intracellular growth with the arbuscular mycorrhizae. All right, so you will have to be able to identify this on the quiz in the practical. So these are slides of the ectomycorrhizae. And here you can clearly see this is a cross section of a root. Here's the root itself right here. Here is the sheath that is being created by the ectomycorrhizae. And everything blue is the fungi. And you can see that the fungi are growing between the cells or intercellularly. Now, comparing that to the arbuscular mycorrhizae, again, you're not going to see a sheath here. Again, this is a cross section of a root. And here, all the pink lines everywhere are the hyphae of the fungi. And you can see that the fungi are actually growing inside the cells of the root. So this is intracellular. Okay, so that's it for the glomeromycota. So now we're going to talk about zygomycota. Now these are considered your bread molds, and these are the fungi that cause food to spoil. Now zygomycota undergoes both sexual and asexual reproduction, and I'm going to show you their life cycle in a second. Um, but a couple other key characteristics. One, they're going to create something called a zygosporangia. This will be your fruiting body, your N plus N structure and their hyphae are coenocytic, meaning there's no separation between the cells, so it's actually one giant cell for each of these hyphae, meaning they're multinucleated. Now when it comes time for asexual and sexual reproduction, they're going to have hyphae grow upwards to max maximize dispersal. Okay, so here's the life cycle of zygomycota. Again, this is similar to the life cycle that we already went through, so I'm not going to go through each step, but we, we can at least follow the ploidy and look at some of these structures. So here we have our zygomycota growing all across this bread as mold, and it's made up of hyphae. And when it comes time for reproduction, you're going to have two hyphae grow next to each other of two different fungi, 
or two different zygomycotes. Now when this happens, the first thing that's going to happen is that they're going to create gamma tangia, just like we saw before. This is the only time you're going to see a septa. Now the rest of the hyphae of the fungi is coenocytic, no septa. There's multinucleated cells. But here you will see a septa separating the parent hyphae from the gamma tangia it created. And same thing with the corresponding fungi that is going to mate with it. So now we have these two gamma tangia from two different fungi touching each other, and the first thing that's going to happen is plasma gamma. And if you remember with plasma gamma, you had the fusion of the membranes. So now we have this structure that we just created that is N plus N. The plasma membrane fused, bringing the two nuclei into the same cell, but the nuclei did not fuse. So they are still separated inside the cell, making this N plus N. Now this N plus N structure is your fruiting body, and we consider this a zygosporangium inside zygomycota. Okay, so the zygosporangium is going to have multiple N plus N cells inside of it, and one of these cells are going to undergo karyogamy where the nuclei fuse together. So inside the zygosporangium that is N plus N, you're going to have a cell that is 2N, or diploid. We consider that cell that is diploid the zygospore. So the zygospore is then going to germinate out of the zygosporangium. So remember the zygosporangium is N plus N? Well, this germination is actually going to be 2N since it's growing from the zygospore. And all it's doing is growing a stalk that has sporangium on top to release spores to allow it new spores to infect new bread somewhere else. Okay, so here we're just looking at slides of exactly that. So here's the sexual reproduction. Here is your zygosporangium that was created from two gametophytes. Well, here is your sporangia 4, which is that structure that grows outwards to release the spores from the zygospore that was inside the zygosporangium. So this is a sexual structure right here. Or we can also have asexual structures where you have a sporangia for just grow from the hyphae of the parent fungi. So there is no need to create that fruiting body first. This is just a sporangia for that grows straight from the hyphae and creates clone spores of the parent plant. Okay, so that's it for zygomycota. Just understand that the bread molds, understand their life cycle and the structures that they're making. So they make a spor zygosporangium, which is your fruiting body or N plus N structure. And they make a zygospore, which is your 2N zygote, that will eventually grow to be a sporangia 4. And just make sure you can identify these structures under microscope slides like these. All right, the next phylum we're going to talk about is ascomycota. So ascomycota are known as your cup fungi because the fruiting bodies that they create are usually indented in some way and looking like a cup. Here the hyphae are going to be septated, meaning they do have a membrane separating out each one of the cells. Now there is a subgroup of ascomycota called lichen that falls under this phylum, phylum. And lichen are structures that grow on tree bark, and we're going to see an example of that. And they have a symbiotic relationship with algae. Now a lot of the organisms that fall under this phylum are used by humans to make different types of food. Now a lot of the fungi that make moldy cheeses, or the fungi that we eat, like morsels and truffles, or the fungi that we use to make beer and wine and yeast, or yeast itself, is all part of the ascomycota phylum. And there are some ascomycetes that are pathogenic, meaning they can harm us, and there's even some that we use for medicine like penicillium. Penicillium is a type of ascomycete that makes penicillin. Okay, so let's quickly go over the life cycle of ascomycota. So let's start with hyphae of two different ascomycetes. Now remember these hyphae are uh, septated, so they do have membranes separating out the cells, so they're actually uninucleated, they're not multinucleated. So when one hyphae meets another hyphae of another ascomycete, they're going to grow their gamma tangia, just like we saw before. And the first thing that's going to happen is plasma gamma, where you're going to have fusion of these membranes. So when these two gamma tangia fuse, you're going to have haploid nuclei from each of the hyphae come together into one cell. But these nuclei are not going to fuse together, so this is still considered N plus N. Now this N plus N cell, this dikaryotic cell, is going to grow and create new hyphae of all dikaryotic cells. And these hyphae are going to develop into the fruiting body that grows above ground. Now somewhere on this fruiting body, this N plus N fruiting body, you're going to have a cell, usually towards the tip of the cup, that is going to undergo karyogamy. 
Karyogametes when those two haploid nuclei fuse together into a diploid nuclei, and now you have officially created a zygote. Now this zygote is going to divide through meiosis to create haploid spores. And these spores are going to be housed inside a sac called an ascus. And that's where the name of this phylum is coming from because the spores are housed in this sac. However, Ascomycota takes it one step further. Once you have these haploid spores inside your ascus, these haploid spores actually divide through mitosis again, and you end up with eight haploid spores inside your ascus. And these haploid spores are then going to be dispersed into the, the environment as ascus spores, which will later grow up to be hyphae again. All right, so this is just reiterating what is going on inside the ascus. Now remember, you have a dikaryotic cell that undergoes karyogamy to make a 2N zygote. That 2N zygote is going to divide through meiosis to create four haploid spores that are housed inside an ascus. And those haploid spores are going to divide through mitosis again to create eight haploid spores inside this ascus. And this is usually found towards the tip of the cup of these fungi. And these ascospores, these haploid ascospores, will be released into the environment to create new hy hyphae somewhere else. All right, so here's just some cross sections in our microscope of these cup fungi. So if you look towards the tip of the cup, you'll see these ascus, or asci for plural. And when you zoom in, you'll see the eight spores of the ascospores that are inside this ascus, which is the sac. Now sometimes you'll see the spores before they divide through mitosis where you only have four and sometimes you'll see them after mitosis where you have eight. So another thing you should know about Ascomycota is that they do have asexual reproduction and they do so by creating these structures called conidiophore. When it comes time for asexual reproduction, one of the hyphae will simply grow upwards making a conidiophore with conidia spores on top of it and conidia spores are simply just a clone of the parent hyphae. Canadian spores are also known as canidia, so these words are interchangeable. You can use either one. However, just remember that they are a clone of the parent. So here's two examples of canidia spores. So this is one found in Aspergillus, which is a specific genus of fungi. Here is your canidia on top of the canidia spore, which is the specialized hyphae. And here's another example with penicillium, which is the one that's responsible for making penicillin. Here is your canidia spore growing upwards with, with your canidia on top. So just make sure you can identify these asexual structures under a microscope. All right, finally, we're going to talk about Basidiomycota. So Basidiomycota are your club fungi, and these create mushrooms or, or puffballs. So these are the fungi that actually make mushrooms, which a lot of people think fungi are. But actually, fungi are way more diverse than just mushrooms. Okay, so first let's go through the life cycles of Basidiomycota. Here we'll start with your two haploid hyphae. So again, with Basidiomycota, the hyphae are septated. They're separated by septa, so they're not coanacidic. And eventually, when two hyphae meet, they will undergo plasmagamy, fusing their two gametangia together, creating an N plus N structure. That N plus N structure is then going to grow out of the ground as they mushroom here. So that all of this is just densely packed hyphae that are all made up of N plus N cells. And then somewhere on here, usually towards the gills, you're going to have one of the cells undergo karyogamy, where the two haploid nuclei fuse together. And after karyogamy, you have officially made a 2N zygote. This 2N zygote is then going to undergo meiosis. Now, this is different than ascomycota because you only have one round of meiosis without the second round of mitosis. So you really end up with four haploid spores here. But instead of housing them inside a sac like Ascomycota, here Basidiomycota holds them on a pedestal. So that Basidia means pedestal in Latin, and that's where the name's coming from. So you have this pedestal that is holding your four haploid spores upwards. These Basidia spores, as they're known, are then will be flown off into the environment where they'll start growing into new hyphae, which are also haploid. Okay, so another name of the fruiting body is also known as a carp. So here it's considered a basidiocarp because it's for basidiomycota. So your mushroom is technically a basidiocarp, which is the fruiting body. And towards the gills of the mushroom or the basidiocarp is where you're going to find the basidia, which is the pedestal that is going to hold up those haploid basidia spores. So here's your one, two, three spores being held up by this pedestal, which is your basidia. Okay, so that's it for the phylums. I would really spend some time going back and forth between Ascomycota and Basidiomycota because they have a lot of similarities, but really focus on their differences as well. Okay, and the last thing we need to talk about is a special group of fungi called lichen. Now, lichen are fungi that grow on tree barks and rocks, and they have a symbiotic relationship 
with algae, specifically cyanobacteria. Now, most of lichen will fall under the phylum Ascomycota, but there are certain lichen that fall under Basidiomycota as well. So let's talk a little bit about this relationship that they have. So this fungi that is growing on the bark of the tree or on rocks actually stores little tiny algae inside the lichen. And this algae is going to photosynthesize for the lichen. So this is typically cyanobacteria that are doing this. So they're going to provide the fungus with photosynthates like sugars. Well, since these algae are housed inside the fungus, the fungi then or gives them protection from desiccation or drying out. So this is the relationship here. Fungi gives protection to the algae, while algae gives photosynthesis to the fungi. Now, lichen are very sensitive to changes in air quality. So a lot of times people will use these as air quality indicators to show if a certain environment has polluted air or not. All right, so lichen can grow in three different types of structures. So you should just be familiar with these. They can either be crustose, where they grow very flat to the surface of whatever they're growing on. It's almost like a crust that forms on top of the structure. So here's a rock that has lichen growing on it, this crustose lichen. They can grow in folios, which means it looks like foliage. So it kind of looks like this bushy material here. So this is a folios lichen. Or they can grow in the fruticose form, which almost looks like a moss. So this is a fruticose lichen, which is a moss. So again, just be familiar with the three different types of growth forms, either crustose, folios, or fru fruticose. All right, and here is a cross-section of lichen. So this is all the hyphae growing everywhere of the lichen, because they are fungi. This is all haploid structures. And then usually towards the surface, you're going to see the algae be stored. So these algae, again, are inside the lichen getting protection, and they're towards the surface so they can maximize their photosynthesis. So these algae are photosynthesizing, giving photosynthesis to the hyphae, while the hyphae are giving protection to the algae. And these can reproduce through asexual means. So what they'll do is create spores called ceridia. And ceridia is an algae that has this hyphae surrounding it. So hyphae will break off on this algae and the algae and hyphae together will be flung off into the environment where they can start growing on a new surface. So this combination of algae and hyphae in a spore form is called ceridia. Now finally, I would take a second to look at this video. There's not much you need to know here. This is just really showing you parasitic versions of fungi, specifically a type of parasitic fungi that grows out of insects. Now this is a very interesting video. I would suggest that you watch it. Um, it's a short video, but I'm not going to spend any time on this because the video really explains everything that's going on here. All right, so that's it for the PowerPoint um, and everything that you will need to know this week. I know it is a lot. Um, I suggest that you just take your time to draw out each of the life cycles that will help you tremendously with committing all this to memory. And I'll help you understand the ploidy of each step and how it's that ploidy.